Gospel of John, chapter 20 tonight. John, chapter 20, and verse number 31. Let's start reading with verse number 30. The scripture says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And then we find in chapter number 21 and verse number 25 of John, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Father, bless your word now. Amen. Folks, I have a, I have a great respect for Scripture. And uh, I don't know your situation but I personally have a great respect for it. I had three years of Greek grammar, folks, three years, and it wasn't easy. And then I had two years of Hebrew, and man, you talk about a foreign language. I had two years of that. And uh, I do not consider myself tonight at all to be a uh, expert in Greek or Hebrew, but I'll say this very clearly and simply, you won't flim flam me because I know how to check you out. And that's what's important. That's what's very important. You're not going to impress me when you come up and start changing the Bible and telling me it has errors in it and so forth. Uh, you better know what you're talking about because I respect the Bible. I believe it. It's my book, folks. It's my book. And when I read this and says that these are written that you might believe. Now, of course, I have the authorized version, King James Bible, uh, Martin Luther, a German monk got saved. He took, it upon, he took it upon himself, an enormous task, to translate the scriptures into German. And he did. And you'll find that the German translation that Luther made is, uh, I don't know, 99% in agreement with this book. Yes, the reason for that is because he used the same source. The source has to do with manuscript evidence. Now, uh, I'm not here tonight to confuse you, but I do want to tell you that you need to understand what I'm talking about when I say manuscript evidence. It is a big world, folks. Manuscript evidence covers a lot of material, a lot. Fact is, you can spend your whole life studying all the issues involved uh, with manuscript evidence and studying the provenance of the books and so forth and so on. You spend a lot of time doing that. The word extant, uh, most of you know what that word means. It means something that's available that can be touched or can be seen. It's present. None of the books of the Bible are extant in their original form, okay, that we know of. Now, that doesn't mean they don't exist. They could be buried in somewhere, like the Dead Sea Scrolls when they found them. But we do not know. So they are, ex they are not extant so when someone tells you the original says this, it's either one of two things. He's either completely ignorant, and I don't embarrass anyone, but he's ignorant, or he is uh, trying to mess with your mind. Okay? I hope that my ministry at Temple Baptist Church does this, that it strengthens your faith in your Bible. I'm a Bible believer. I believe the Bible. I don't understand all of it, but I believe it. And the Bible is superior to me the mind that wrote the bible is the mind of god he used human agency but it's god's word it's god's book so when the bible tells me that these things are written that i might believe i don't want anybody messing with them right would you no now this is the gospel of john as i've said a thousand times it's probably the last gospel written and it was written about 90 95 a.d somewhere along in there by the apostle john who wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The Gospel of John consummates the direct, the direct revelation of God to mankind as it relates to salvation. It goes no further. If anything is written after this, and much was, 
I, it is not worth the paper it's written on as far as I'm concerned. Now, there's a lot of material out there that professes to be or proposes to be holy scripture. Between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, you have what's called the Jewish or Old Testament Apocrypha. The Apocrypha means hidden. These are hidden books that were written during the time that the canon of scripture closed with Malachi and then opened again when John the Baptist began to preach the kingdom of heaven is in hand. During this period of time, uh, books like Bell and the Dragon, Tobit, Judith, and 1st and 2nd, 3rd, 4th, Maccabees, and on it goes. These books were written during this period of time. They have value. Maccabees, for example, is valuable in the sense that it's history, and we accept it as history. And uh, the reason for that is because there is profane or secular history that agrees with what the book of Mal uh, the books of Malachi talk about. So I have no problem with that. My problem is with the Jewish Apocrypha is when it begins to teach doctrines that are contrary to the scripture. So ask yourself a question here tonight. We have 39 Old Testament books and 27 new. Who chose that? See, I know they had synods that uh, chose certain books, said these, these, these books are, uh, are uh, you know, inspired scripture. But really, why do none of the originals exist as far as we know? Could it be that they were handed around and read so many times and at that day you know Gutenberg hadn't been born yet and he had no press and so everything had to be hand copied and that's what the scribe did and he used what's called the Masora. What is the Masora? It's called a fence to the scripture. Ethelbert Bullinger in his, uh, in his companion Bible has a good, uh, a good take on the Masora. This is where we get the Masoretic uh, vowel points, the Masorites. And this is how we know how to pronounce Old Testament Hebrew words. If we did not have these Masorite vowel points, we would not know how to pronounce these words. We would not know. And uh, don't leave it to English. Now, you know English comes in three basic forms, Old English, Middle English, and Modern English. You go back to Old English and take Old German and you don't have a whole lot of difference between the two of them because they came from the same place and then they diverged. And then German, of course, gets off into a lot. You got high German, low German, this, that, so forth and so on. But the bottom line is that the English that we speak today is modern English and in 1600 AD, 1611 AD, it was modern English. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, I know it's not street English, I understand that, but it's modern English. God said he would preserve his word and he would give us his word in our language. Why preserve it if you can't read it? What good is a book if you can't read that book? You see what I mean? And the, and the literary content of the Bible, the New Testament and the Old Testament, that's not Shakespeare. How many's ever read Shakespeare? Had Shakespeare in high school. Shakespeare's got a lot of beautiful stuff in it, folks, but you've got to think <laughs> when you're reading Shakespeare. you really got to think about what this man's saying, and uh, it's not easy. Well, the King James Bible is, is uh, I think someone said, written on a 7th or an 8th grade level, something like that. The sad thing is today that we've dumbed down our educational system in this country, and we've got high school graduates that are pr practically illiterate. I mean, it's a shame. But here we come back to the Bible. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Old Testament, about 1,900 B.C. Job is a contemporary of Abraham. He's also a contemporary of Melchizedek. And at that time, Jerusalem was uh, Salem. It was the city of peace, all right? And it was name was changed to Jerusalem. Uh, later, when David took it and he established the kingdom, gave the capital to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is an old city. But we go back before the law was ever given. Moses had the law given to him at Sinai about 1,400 B.C. That's 500 years after the book of Job. But in the book of Job, as I've preached two or three messages now, they understood right and wrong. They understood the will of God in certain ways. They understood, they understood, understood the teachings of morality, right and wrong, and all of that. And they understood that. There was no priesthood. There was no temple. There was no Bible. The Bible did not exist, yet they had a knowledge of God because God handed it down from generation to generation. 
Now, if you get into the book of Psalms, chapter number 19, you'll read where he talks about the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Night after night uttereth speech. What you get into there is what Job talks about, Mazareth. It literally means the stations or the, or, or the, or the boxes that hold a message that is in the stars. And this message in the stars was given long before the Word of God was ever written down. Now, I know I'll be accused of astrology, and I'm not into astrology. I don't read the stars. But I wonder, I wonder if you've ever really thought much about why Orion and Pleiades and uh, these names are mentioned in the book of Job long before the Bible was ever written. Think about it. Think about Job talking about a bridegroom coming up, showing up in the heavens from Virgo to Leo. You'll find all over the globe where they have, uh, they have a, 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 the constellations, we call them. You'll find that probably 90% of the time they are mostly in agreement, starts with Virgo and ends with Leo. Well, who is Virgo? Virgo's the virgin. Who is Leo? Leo's the lion. So the virgin and through the 12... Uh, constellations comes up to Virgo, to Leo rather, who the lion is coming back. Now that's quite a remarkable thing, don't you think? It's quite a coincidence, right? <laughs> yeah, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed, it says in the book of Revelation. So what he's saying, preacher? Well, have you read in the book of Jude where it says that uh, that uh, that Enoch prophesied of these, said, and behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment, so forth and so on. And here we have a New Testament book quoting something that was said thousands of years before and making a prophetic application to it long before the Bible was ever written. In plain words, to cut to the chase, God revealed certain things to people before the book was ever written, and they had a knowledge of God and a knowledge of His will a knowledge of things that they would not otherwise have had had it not been handed to them. It was passed down from generation to generation. Well, that's a wonderful thing. Amen. I've given you quite a bit now to think about. The Jewish Apocrypha that separates Malachi from Matthew includes a lot of things that aren't necessarily things that you would want to, uh, that you'd want to, uh, that you'd want to believe. For example, let me give you some of them that are mentioned in the Apocrypha. These are things that it teaches. For example, in the book of Tobit, teaches justification by works and not by faith. In 2 Maccabees, you'll find the doctrine of purgatory pops up. You ask the Catholic, where does purgatory come from? It's not in the Bible. Well, he'll say it's in the, it's in the Apocrypha because they accept it as canonical scripture. For example, Baruch, which is one of these uh, 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 apocryphal books, says God answers the prayers of the dead. Now, we don't find that in the Bible, not at all. In the book of the wisdom, chapter number 8, it says souls existed before they unite with the body. See what happens? Here's when your soul came into existence. God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. That's what the Bible says. So we have a conflict going on with apocryphal books and the Word of God, the Word of the, the Scriptures. Now, there's another group of books called pseudopigraphic writings. What does that mean? Pseudos in Greek means false. Pigrapha is right, to write, okay? So it means a false writing. Essentially what it means is that we have a book that says, for example, it is the, let me find some of the, some of the titles for you to give you an idea of what I'm talking about tonight. Here we are. The Gospel of Thomas, all right? The Gospel of Mary. The Gospel of Philip, all right? The Gospel of Nicodemus. The Epistle of Ignatius. The Epistle of, or to the Ephesians. And the Epistle of Ignatius to the Romans. Well, my goodness, Ignatius is what's called an apostolic father, along with Polycarp. If he wrote an epistle to the Ephesians and an epistle to the Romans, and the books of Ephesians and Romans are very powerful New Testament books, then I'd like to know what Ignatius had to say, wouldn't you? But you see, he didn't write those books. He didn't write them. That's what pseudopigraphy means, a false, 
a false attestation to someone who didn't write the book. They, neither, none of these men wrote this. Mary did not write the gospel. Thomas did not write that one. Philip did not write these. Yet they say they did. And then, of course, you get into the Gnostic Gospels. And, of course, you know what the Gnostic Gospels are. These are the ones that were found at Nag Hammadi, and that's northern Egypt. And uh, these Gnostic Gospels teach a lot of false garbage. For one thing, they change the, time, the identity and the essence of our Lord Jesus Christ. But listen to what some of the modern thinking has, uh, says about these Gnostic Gospels. Listen to this. The Gnostic Gospels continue to exert a profound influence on contemporary religious thought, spirituality, and theological discourse. Despite their ancient origins, these texts have sparked renewed interest and debate within academic circles, religious communities, popular culture, shaping the way individuals engage with Christian history and diversity of early Christian beliefs, the influence of the Gnostic Gospels today can be observed, so forth and so on. These texts provide a bridge for exploring the intersections between Gnosticism, Christianity, and other spiritual movements. Notice here, notice intersection. Fostering a deeper understanding of the diverse religious landscape of the ancient world and its relevance to contemporary religious pluralism. Let me just put that in simple terms. The Gnostic Gospels help the modern, anything goes, everybody's going up uh, to the top of the mountain, you just take a different route, we're all headed to the same place. Uh, no one Christ is not the only way to heaven. This stuff today, this, this cafeteria type religion that you're getting out here on the street, that's what they're saying. They're saying the Gnostic Gospels support that idea and that 2,000 years ago when they were written, that's what the original Christians believed. Even though they have destroyed the identity of Christ, made him the husband of Mary Magdalene, and say that a whole bloodline, the Merovingian bloodline of Europe, are direct descendants. Mr. Brown made a pile of money with that. And you've got young people today who have read that. And now it's messed their mind up completely. So here's the point. You take all this other stuff, pseudepigraphic, apocryphal books, Gnostic gospels, on and on and on and on. There's a lot of this stuff. But you take that, where does it lead? You judge a tree with the fruit it bears. What has that produced? It's produced confusion for one thing. But it's also laying the foundation for ecumenicism. It's laying the foundation for the very heart and soul of the Antichrist religion. Listen, the Antichrist doesn't care if you worship Christ. The Romans didn't care if you worship Christ 2,000 years ago. Just as long as he knew his place. Are oh, you following me? Yeah. Because when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, then he has separated himself from universalism, from all the rest of it, and he has said, I am the only way, and, and, and there is no other access to the Father but by me, and religion hates that. They hate it. And so that's where you are today. So I hear men all the time. I heard one the other day, and I have respect for him. I was listening to him. It kind of surprised me when he said what he did. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 16, turn that with me, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter number 16. Verse number 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say there art John the Baptist, Elias, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. That's a title. That's not a name. Mashiach. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the, th all right, you see this? He, Jesus answered and said unto him, 
Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now watch carefully what it says. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Have you read it? You've read it a thousand times. Every time you read the Bible, the book of Matthew, you read that. All right? How hard is that to understand? What you will bind, present tense, will be bound, present tense. Well, he went into a long thing quoting a scholar who said, well, now, we need to understand that the verb tense of this was different 2,000 years ago and that really what it's saying is this. And whatsoever has been bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever has been loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, did I change the meaning of that? Of course I did. In plain words, what he's saying is all you're doing is agreeing with what's already been done, and the authority is not in your hands. The authority is somewhere else entirely. Now, why did he do it? He did it to attack the Roman Catholic idea that a priest has the authority of absolution to absolve you of your sins. And they, of course, say they do. They can put you in what's called auricular confession, put you in a booth, priest on one side, you're on the other, you begin to open your heart up and confess your sins to the priest. Note carefully, he's a priest. Now, we're talking about them and what they believe. He's a priest. He's a go-between between between you and God. And so the priest says, all right, I've heard. I absolve you. You're cleansed. You're forgiven of your sins. So they've made their trip to the priest. They've been absolved. They've been cleansed. And everything is okay. Does a man have the, uh, the authority to do that, folks? No. No. There's only one that can cleanse your sin and absolve you of your sin and take your sin away. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the pastor of the church, <laughs> the chief muckety-muck of the denomination. <laughs> no. One God, one mediator between God and man, who? That's right. You know who it is. The man, Christ Jesus. No, carefully. The man. He's the son of God, but it's not as the son of God he does it. He does it as the man because he earned the right to intercede on your behalf and approach the father as the man who lived a sinless, perfect life and ascended to heaven by his own righteousness. Look at Romans chapter number 10. This is one of the first verses I learned when I got saved because I was wanted other people to get saved. I wanted them to know the Lord. And the 10th chapter of Romans uh, was a very, to me at the time, appeared to be very simple. Look at verse number 13, Romans chapter number 10. For whosoever shall be baptized shall be saved. So whosoever shall join the church shall be saved. For whosoever shall mean well shall be saved. What's it say? Notice carefully, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, uh, it's not a definite thing in the sense that it doesn't tell you what you say, but it tells you what you do. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? Right. It doesn't give you a sinner's prayer. Now, there's nothing wrong with sinner's prayers, but believe me, folks, <laughs> believe me tonight, sinners have prayed a lot of different prayers to get saved. You can count on that. No, oh, you can believe that. And uh, absolutely, they prayed what came from the heart, and if it came from the heart, it reached the heart of God, it did, they were born again. But look what he puts in here in the 10th chapter of Romans. Now, who wrote Romans, by the way? That rank heretic, the Apostle Paul, right? You see, they're trying, they're trying to diminish him. There's a crowd out there that says that he is not an apostle, well, they, were in, they had a crowd in 1 Corinthians that, that questioned his credentials. But look what it says. Of course, you know, when I say stuff like this, I say it tongue-in-cheek. I fully believe the Apostle Paul is inspired the Apostle of God, can write Scripture and all that. You know that. But Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. 
For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now stop just a moment and go back to chapter number 9. Romans 9 and verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience bearing me witness that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. That's strong talk. My kinsmen according to the flesh. Note carefully, he has a fleshly identity with them. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers, and of whom are, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now who is this comparing him with? Who would, you think, who would you think this is a comparison to? Ishmael. See, Abraham had two sons, folks. Ishmael was 13 years old, older than Isaac. Now look at this. In verse number, uh, verse number 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the, for the seed. For this is the word of God, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah hath also conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now look at this argument. Look what he just gave you. He just told you that God is the ultimate arbiter, that God makes the ultimate choice and decision. And then in Romans chapter number 10, in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, they may be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now look at verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You remember what I said about Job? How that Job, Daniel, all right, who's that other one? Build an ark. Noah, all right. They're mentioned in the Old Testament and their righteousness because they're mentioned as the righteous ones. Then the book of Job has to do with God's sovereignty over man. Job never did know. He was never told that Satan and God had had a confrontation. You don't find it in Job. God did not explain to Job what happened, why it happened, all of the issues involved. Job was required to believe and trust that that one that resides between the cherubim makes no mistakes. And he yielded himself to his absolute authority. And by doing that, he established a righteousness that he would be praised for throughout the Old Testament. This is what he's calling on them to do right here. Same thing, same thing. God made a choice between Isaac and Ishmael. God made that choice. Now, please understand this in the middle of all of this. I'm not a five-point Calvinist, <laughs> and I'm not telling you for a moment that the only ones that are going to be saved are the ones that God chose or elected. But what I am telling you is election is a Bible doctrine, and when God elects, he elects because he is sovereign to do it, but it does not say that just because you are not elect, you can't be saved. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that only the elect can be saved. 
Now write that down. That's important. That's very important. But here's the key. Here's the point. The point is that you believe in God's righteousness. Do you believe if God says you're a sinner, you're a sinner? Do you believe even though you can't understand it, you, you, there may be sins that fly across your head and you don't even know they're sins? I'm capable of that. How about you? We all are. We may in our own eyes feel like that we've lived a sinless life this day or we've lived, a, we've lived a, you know, an exemplary life the last five or ten years and that we're living for the little bottom line is God does not leave it up to you to discern the very essence and foundation of sin. He takes that upon himself and he looks at you and says, are you willing to believe what I say about you and your righteousness? Are you willing to believe that tonight? Well, then here's what he says in Romans 10. He said, Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, verse 5, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, now look at it, say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Wait a minute, where do we find that in the Old Testament? Where? It's in Deuteronomy. And you've also got the 22nd and the 23rd and the 24th Psalm. Do you remember the antiphony? Do you remember when he ascended to heaven by his own righteousness? And one said, who is this? Who dares approach? Who dares ascend? He's coming by his own righteousness. Is he crazy? Is he out of his mind? He's going to approach God by his own righteousness? You mean the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't have better sense to know that by his own righteousness, once he approaches that almighty being, he'll be consumed by his holiness? There is nothing, there is no one that is capable by their own righteousness to approach God. Yes, there is one. And this is what you're told to believe in Romans 10. Look at it. Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. In other words, you can't believe that he was sinless and perfect and righteous like no other. Then if you can't believe that, you're trying to reach up there and pull him back down. That's what it says. You're trying to pull him back down out of heaven. So you have to acknowledge you deserve judgment. You deserve hell. You're a sinner. God says you are. You can't question him. You can't argue with him because he's the boss. He's sovereign. And if he says it, that finishes it. And if you're willing to believe it, here's what he says he'll do. For who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Look at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Did he raise him from the dead? Is he alive? Then he says, thou shalt be saved. For with a heart man believeth unto righteousness and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And then here we are. This is the biggest whosoever in the whole Bible. Doesn't get any bigger than this. For whosoever. Red man, yellow man, black man, white man. Bond man, free man, rich man, poor man. Sorry low down piece of garbage. Best moral man you ever knew. President of the United States, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Attorney General, four-star generals. Makes no difference. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Now that's pretty plain. Notice what's not in there. There's not a bit of water, not one drop. <laughs> not a drop of water anywhere. Notice. Don't you think if it was that important it'd be in there? Sure it would. The Bible's not written to confuse you. This is why there is no formula to being saved. Salvation is a person and not a formula. Do you believe Jesus is sinless? Do you believe he lived a sinless, perfect life? Do you believe he died on the cross? There he suffered six hours on that tree and then, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, gave up the ghost, and they took his body off of the tree and laid it in the virgin tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And then on the third day, they went and found the, tomb, the, 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 the stone rolled away. He said, why seek you the living among the dead? His angel said that. You mean he's a live preacher? 
If he's not alive, our faith is in vain. The apostle said in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ be not risen, then your faith is vain. It's empty. But if Christ is risen, hallelujah, to glory to God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's the foundation of our faith. If you can keep him in the grave, we're finished. But if he arose from the dead and ascended, he wasn't pulled up. He ascended. In other words, this sinless, perfect being had completed his ministry. He had run his course. He had finished it. And he began to rise. Man. And he's at the right hand of the Father. You believe that? And you know, and you accept what he says about you as a sinner. I do. No argument from me. Good night. No. No argument. Well, then he said, if you'll call on my name, I'll save you. Amen. Any book, I don't care who wrote it and how important it is, any book that, a, that assaults or attacks any part of what I just gave you from Romans chapter number 10 is a piece of garbage. It's pure garbage. The 10th chapter of Romans is one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible. Amen. Have you called on his name? Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time in your house tonight. I pray that I've done what I should do in exalting our Lord Jesus by lifting him up tonight in his righteousness and he becomes the focal point of salvation. It's all about what they believe about him, not what they believe about themselves or me or anything else. It's what they believe about him. And these things are written that we may understand him. The Bible's written it point us to him, to know him. And that's what, by the grace of God, I tried to do tonight. In Jesus' name. You had your bow. Nobody's looking. Nobody's looking. Is anybody in this house tonight say, Preacher, I just want you to pray for me, and I'll just pray for you. I'll do that. I'll pray for you. Uh, I've been confused. I've been to different churches. A lot of people are. A lot of people are. I mean, uh, and a lot of times I understand it fully. I mean, you grow up in some culture, grow up in some place, the only thing around in such and such a church, that's the one you went to, that's all you ever knew. But then you start getting more light. Yeah, yeah. Then you start understanding more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then things begin to change. Oh, yeah, I understand that too. Amen. I'd say pray for me tonight, preacher. I pray that God will continue to lead me. God will show me. God will teach me. I want to know what the Lord says. And I don't want anybody messing with my Bible. I've got a book that I believe, and I don't want to mess with it. God bless you. Amen. I don't want somebody to get in my face telling me I, my Bible's got errors in it, mistranslation, so forth and so on. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else say pray for me tonight? I've been confused, not sure about a lot of things. God bless you. Another hand over there. I'm doing this tonight to help, folks, to help. Anybody else? Father, we gave forth what you gave me. I've emptied my soul. I'm at peace. I go home and sleep tonight, Lord, and I can go home and rest. I've done what I'm supposed to do. That's who I am. That's what I am. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you. Now, bless your word and bless these dear folks who raised their hand. Lord, by doing that, they acknowledge that you, they want you to show them more. They want you to move in their heart. They want you to teach them, give them more light. And the more light they get, the more accountable they are. I pray for them tonight. There may be those who are watching by, by their Internet now. As we live stream, they may be listening to this. Who knows? They might have even raised their hand out there. and Nobody could see it, but they can. And they've received what I said tonight. And they understand tonight that a sinless, perfect man ascended to the right hand of the Father. And they believe that. They believe what the Father says about them. And by doing that, they make themselves candidates to simply by calling on your name, they can be saved. I pray for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you, folks.